Hi everybody, Brendan here with another edition of This Month in Punk Rock History. Remember last month when we said Peel Sessions came to be seen as the holy grail for unknown bands? Well, if the BBC was the holy grail, an American tour was certainly the Ark of the Covenant. It's February 2023, and this month in punk rock history, we take a look at the first successful tour in North America by a UK punk band. But first, as always, I want to take a moment to offer a quick shout out to my host, Sweet Jimmy Network. Check out previous editions of this month in punk rock history, as well as 60 second reviews, all new greetings, and scatterbrain movie reviews. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe and start fights in the comment section. Now, let's get into it. 1976's Anarchy in the UK tour was the first big punk tour. Initially featuring the Sex Pistols, the Damned, and the Clash, the national tour of the UK was disastrous. Between opposition from local authorities and rivalry among the bands, the tour had more dates cancelled than played. And when each of the bands went their separate ways, gaining their own respective fan bases, they each took a turn at conquering the new world. First, in 1977, the Damned played a handful of gigs at CBGB in New York, and the Rat in Boston, before getting screwed over by television's Tom Verlaine at the Whiskey A Go Go in Hollywood. Thanks to the West Coast punks, though, they were able to salvage the tour with gigs in LA and San Francisco, but America had chewed up the damned and spit them out back to England. Then in 1978, it was the Sex Pistols' turn. The No Future bus made its way through the American South, fighting off cowboys, offending the locals, overselling small clubs, and fighting among each other. By the time the two-week tour wrapped up in San Francisco, the pistols were out of ammo. America ate them alive. They broke up and eventually returned as individuals rather than a band. Ah, <laughs> ever get the feeling you've been cheated? Good night. Now, these two tours started in the East and worked their way West. Finally, in 1979, The Clash took the opposite route and started on the West Coast. This seems to have been the key to a successful tour. Not only did The Clash survive the Give Up Enough Rope tour, but they also came back later that year. They also came back in 1980, 81, 82, and 84, starting in California for most of these. But let's back up to the name of the tour. Traditionally, the tour is named after the record being supported, and so CBS, the traditional record company, promoted the tour as Give Em Enough Rope, with a restrained Statue of Liberty on the posters. Having just seen two of their contemporaries go down in flames, however, the band thought the suicide mission that was an American tour would more appropriately be called Pearl Harbor. And so it was that on January 31st, 1979, the Clash stormed Vancouver. By this time, punk had pretty much spread worldwide, and the initial wave that spawned the Clash, along with the Pistols and the Damned, had crashed. In Vancouver, though, punk was still very underground. There was a small but dedicated scene of a few dozen punks of the ripped denim jacket variety, but over a thousand fans packed into the Commodore Ballroom that night. The local opener was the all-female trio Dishrags, one of the founding bands of the Vancouver and perhaps greater Canadian scene. In tribute to their headliners, the Dishrags closed their set with a cover of London's Burning. After a support set from blues legend Bo Diddley, The Clash opened their set with complete control and rolled through a few other hits before frontman Joe Strummer announced with a wink their next song would be a Dishrags cover, London's Burning. To be clear, you heard correctly. In between punk bands was bluesman Bo Diddley. An unconventional choice to be sure. So why would they invite a blues act to join a punk tour? Gather around kids, it's time for a history lesson within a history lesson. When Clash frontman Joe Strummer died in 2002, BBC News wrote, The Clash arguably gave punk a classic pop sensibility, and their vital spirit in turn influenced later bands. One could say the same about Bo Diddley's influence on rock and roll. I've referred to Diddley as a blues legend, which he is, but he's also often cited, along with Chuck Berry and Little Richard, as the founding father of rock and roll. While failing to achieve the same levels of success in the U.S. as these contemporaries, he was huge in England. He was a direct influence on bands such as the Yardbirds and the Rolling Stones, both of whom covered his songs. Diddley is said to have popularized the power chord, and the so-called Bo Diddley beat, heard in the background here, can be heard from artists as varied as Elvis Presley, The Electric Prunes, Elton John, and of course, The Clash, as well as many, many others to this day. Indeed. Bo Diddley was a musical hero of The Clash, and that's exactly why they wanted him. 
So, recently installed manager Caroline Kuhn approached the band's American label about hiring Bo Diddley. They were less than enthused. In a 2001 interview with Q Magazine, she recalled audible gasps as the label cautioned against hiring a black performer. At the Clash's insistence, though, they got what they wanted, and when they first met in Vancouver, Strummer was awestruck by the legend. But once the initial awkwardness was overcome, they all got along just fine, as you can see by this totally candid and not at all staged photo. Many years later, in a televised interview, Diddley said the sheer magnitude of each concert with the number of amps and volume of sound was ridiculous. Now you uh, opened for The Clash in the late 70s. Now I imagine that's a different audience than you would play oh, for on the average man, day. What was that, that experience was like? That was ridiculous. That was ridiculous. I never heard... Well, you know, if you can play, you don't need 12 amplifiers stacked upside the wall for a bass fill. Uh, 15 amplifiers with a guitar uh, and all of them 600 watts apiece. I mean, the whole, come on. You don't need that. My ears is hurting still <laughs> from listening at that, sh that crowd. Okay, back to the tour. From Vancouver, they headed south towards their U.S. debut in California, stopping to rest in Seattle, where they awoke the next morning to news of a friend's death. Strummer was reportedly so distraught over his friend's passing that he was unable to eat, but the show must go on. So on February 7th, 1979, they landed at the Berkeley Community Theater in Berkeley, California, where the opening act, appropriately enough, was Pearl Harbor and the explosions. While Canadian audiences were reminiscent of earlier UK crowds with just the right level of rowdiness, the college kids at Berkeley listened politely. Strummer was irked by the tepidity of the crowd and held no qualms about expressing this backstage. The official itinerary had the band booked in Santa Monica next, but an unnamed Asian provocateur tipped the band to a benefit gig that may or may not have actually existed before securing the international headliners. Now, the contract is a contract. And you can read it for yourself in this photostatic copy. I, the undersigned, shall forfeit all rights, privileges, and licenses, hearing and hearing contained, etc., etc. Fax mentis incendium gloria culpum, etc., etc. Memo bis punitor delicatum. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. And The Clash were not allowed to play off tour. So, hastily produced flyers advertised a white riot in the film war with the only English band that matters. And at 9 p.m. on Thursday, February 8th, locals Negative Trend and The Zeros opened at the site of Jim Jones's original cult headquarters in San Francisco for an unnamed Clash cover band consisting of Joe Strummer, Mick Jones, Paul Simonon, and Topper Heaton. The band raised over $4,000 for New Youth, a group dedicated to keeping the punk scene affordable and fair. With no time to bask in the glory of rebellion, it was back to their day jobs, back to the bus, and forward to the next official gig. In Santa Monica, the local opener was The Dills, who were supposedly once called California's The Clash. Local punks were angry about the high ticket prices, the same as was recently charged by the Rolling Stones, but still, the venue sold out. Among the crowd, at least outside the venue, was current reactionary and future Minuteman Mike Watt, who ran into Keith Morris, then of Black Flag. Morris was handing out flyers for a San Pedro gig, thus introducing Watt to a punk scene in his own backyard. Back inside the Civic Auditorium, record company execs swarmed backstage for a photo op with The Clash, but, according to Strummer, the band had no time for these publicity stunts as they had to get on the road to their next destination. Next stop... That's right, Cleveland, 2,400 miles northeast of Los Angeles. The long trip allowed for some bonding time with Bo, but remember earlier when I said the label expected trouble due to the color of Mr. Diddley's skin? Well, the Clash's militaristic wardrobe and the American South's general mistrust of rock and roll didn't help. The bus was pulled over in Texas for reasons unknown, but with a significant amount of cash on hand and who knows what illegal substances, this could have been trouble. But the quick-thinking driver, remembering the bus had just been used for a Dolly Parton tour, invoked the name of the Queen of Country, and the cops quickly backed down from their demand that everyone exit the bus. They were allowed to continue, but the fierce Southern Plains winter proved too much for everyone. I laid a quick night out, a man of peace. Finally in Cleveland, the concert at the legendary Agora featured local opener, this guy. 
Alex Bevan, self-styled as a Rust Belt song wrangler, a Lake Erie troubadour, an uncommonly quirky storyteller, everybody's slightly crazy uncle with a guitar. While there's always been room for a few folkies in punk, like Patrick Fitzgerald or Billy Bragg, this guy wasn't even close. Think more Shel Silverstein and less Pete Seeger. According to a gig review in Mongoloid Fanzine, the Cleveland crowd was subdued and practiced self-restraint as evidenced by none of the beer cans being thrown actually hitting him. Alex escaped in one piece, though visibly pissed off, says the review. The crowd was marginally more welcoming to Bo Diddley, but anxiously awaited the headliners. Having left the Dolly Parton bus in Oklahoma City, the group boarded Waylon Jennings' bus three hours behind schedule due to their inability to pay the hotel bill. That's right, halfway through the tour, the clash was out of cash. Manager Caroline Kuhn had to beg the label to wire money to Cleveland or else meet them at the state border. We'd be the bus with the highway patrol chasing it, said Kuhn. Anyway, on to D.C. The snow they escaped in the Sooner State seemed to catch up with them in the Rust Belt. And after a few stops to de-ice the bus, they arrived in D.C. After what Strubber describes as a brief skirmish at their first hotel, they checked into the Americana at 2.30 in the morning of February 15th. Mick Jones somehow got his hands on a sightseeing map and immediately wanted the band to visit Arlington National Cemetery to see the JFK Eternal Flame, to which Joe Strummer is alleged to have said, Great, let's piss on it and put it out. At showtime, Bo Diddley, having been screwed over in the past and having witnessed the accounting issues at the Cleveland Hotel, demanded to be paid before taking the stage. So, manager Caroline Kuhn made a bank run to get the bluesman his daily stipend of $10,000. Cash. With pockets stuffed, Diddley was reunited on stage with his original bass player, Chester Lindsay. Their performance was filmed as B-roll for a television interview, but the film crew took off immediately after the set, so there's no footage of The Clash's performance. The opener was the D-Seats, Washington's answer to Pearl Harbor and the explosions, though no record exists of front lady Martha Hull marrying Paul Simonon. The Clash's performance was electrifying, so much so that Mick Jones, tired of getting shocked by the faulty wiring in his guitar, smashed it on stage upon conclusion of the set. He later commented that he used to hate when bands did that. From Georgetown to Beantown, The Clash and Bo Diddley finally reached the East Coast where they hit the Harvard Square Theater in Cambridge, Mass. The local openers were short-lived art punk trio The Rentals, comprised of husband and wife Jeff and Jane Hudson, teachers at the prestigious School of the Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University. On drums was their student, Pseudo Carroll. A review in Diamond's fanzine says the trio invoke a sense of Susie and the Banshees, but failed to connect to the crowd exponentially larger than their typical fan base. And of the anachronistic Bo Diddley, reviewer Brian Goslow writes of similar bewilderment felt in other locations. Goslow said of the clash that their larger-than-life reputation and two years of hype led to an inevitable letdown. Writing for New York Rocker magazine, Doug Simmons says the Clash's angry energy failed to penetrate the depths of the 1,600-strong crowd. Throughout the 22-song set, Strummer complained of the gulf between the band and the crowd created by the venue's orchestra pit, while fans in the nosebleed seats complained of shoddy sound. Finally, it was on to New York. This was an important gig, and the Clash knew it. To paraphrase old Blue Eyes, if they could make it there, they could make it anywhere. Indeed, according to Strummer's NME tour diary, Bo Diddley confirmed this, saying the worst audiences in the U.S. were Detroit and New York City. But if the Clash was to secure a foothold in the American market, they had to conquer New York. And by all accounts, they did. Besides the usual diehard punkers and curious kids, the entirety of the New York and international music press was there, as well as the who's who of 1979 New York, including Martin Scorsese, Carrie Fisher, Debbie Harry, Bruce Springsteen, Andy Warhol, and 12-year-old Harley Flanagan among them. This was a make-or-break moment for the group, and while other openers crawled back into the obscurity from whence they came, the band chosen to kick off this evening was... The Cramps. For some context, the Cramps were, at the time, only slightly less obscure than Ohio Guy or Pearl Harbor or even the Dish Rags. They started in California and moved to New York, but still felt like outsiders among the insular punk scene, and were considering a further move to London when one fateful night, Joe Strummer caught their set at Hurrah's nightclub. Strummer told them they were the best American band he had seen. The Cramps' unique proto-psychobilly sound, combining elements of punk and early rock and roll, was a perfect bridge between the new wave of The Clash and the old school of Bo Diddley. So not only was this gig a game-changer for The Clash, but it also catapulted their opening act into success. Cramps guitarist Poison Ivy Rorschach compared The Clash's energy that night to that of an atom bomb. Sounds Magazine called The Clash's set a triumph from start to finish. 
Rolling Stone called it inspiring. Robert Christgau wrote, No one has ever made rock and roll as intense as The Clash. Lester Bang said it was one of the best rock and roll shows he had ever witnessed. And Andy Warhol said, The Clash are cute, but they all have bad teeth and scream about getting rid of the rich. The tour was almost over. In 10 days, they covered 3,800 miles from Vancouver to Santa Monica to New York. The Palladium gig was the third of three shows performed in three days. They were exhausted and in desperate need of R&R. So they spent the following day in New York City, hanging out with Warhol and visiting the infamous Studio 54. Finally, it was on to the Rex Stanforth Theater in Toronto. Once again, though, the American winter proved too much for the touring party, so they hopped a plane to the Great White North. Here, Toronto's claim to first all-female punk band, The Curse, opened. According to Kanakistan Music, The Curse was out to shock, offering rum-punch-soaked tampons as the sole choice of drink at their record release party for their only single, Shoeshine Boy, a song about one of the most horrific and brutal crimes in Toronto's recent memory. With an aim at upsetting the establishment, it's easy to see why The Clash liked this group. Issues with sound Issues with bouncers and issues with promoters plagued the headliner's set. The tech in charge of the house lights was caught between the demands of the band and those of the venue, but it didn't matter. While the first show on the tour was a warm-up in Vancouver, it was a prologue to the real tour, Toronto was a wind-down, an epilogue. The tour was a success, at least in terms of gaining the popularity in the United States. Financially, not so much. Caroline Kuhn reportedly put out thousands of dollars from her own pocket to help support her boys. Of course, the label profited off the success by releasing a version of The Clash's previously withheld debut self-titled album that summer. But they did it. Not only did The Clash survive America, but they also conquered it. In the winter, no less. They conquered New York, and if you can make it there, well, you know. Soon after the tour, a new single dropped, followed by a new album. In between releases, more non-stop touring, which, as I said earlier, included a return to the U.S. So that's it. Thanks for watching our look at The Clash's first American tour. If you were at any of these gigs, have your grandchildren help you leave a comment below. For this month in punk rock history, I'm Brendan McCabe. Join me next month when we celebrate St. Patrick's Day with a massacre. Sort of. No one actually died. Just, just watch and don't forget to keep up on my almost daily tales of the punk rock of old via tiprh.start.page.